Ceramics, our favorite way of serving food. Do you like this sound? No, it's very unpleasant. Ceramics aren't inadequate as tableware, but surely can't be the best solution we've produced after millennia of eating. Ceramics are heavy and cold to the touch. They clatter and clink, and being efficient conductors of heat, they are not the best containers of hot foods. So given the immense time to design, iterate, and develop such product, what is an adequate alternative? Splash it on. One example is Japanese lacquerware. Lacquerware is lighter, allowing you to feel the weight of the food. It's better at containing heat, so you get a mild sense of the warmth, and it doesn't pierce the ear with clinks, but offers subtle indications of movement. Even deeper is the aesthetic of lacquerware. Ceramics reveal your food entirely, adding no depth or quality, but presenting every nuance and color. With lacquerware, there's a beauty in its initial offering. If you've ever been in a Japanese restaurant, you likely had miso soup and may understand this distinction. It comes in the moment you gaze into the soup, at the still liquid and the dark depths of the bowl. As interesting as I find bowls and soup, this is quite far from the extent of our discussion today. But before we go any further, I would like to make very clear that this video is heavily inspired by Jun Ichiro Tanazaki's essay titled In Praise of Shadows. It's a quick read, so if you're interested in Tanazaki's nostalgic take on Japanese beauty, I highly recommend it. Back to the bowls, you may have picked up that a refined, more subtle quality evokes a better sense of beauty. However, beauty is subjective, and any point made in favor of Japanese aesthetic can be simply dismissed by an individual's taste. A more objective measurement for assessment is the bowl's utility. Why is it that ceramics are so mainstream when lacquerware seemingly dominates in both form and function? Even modern inventions with utility clearly superior to past counterparts functionally ignore their ultimate impact on humans. The brain, a pulpy mass of cells and fibers. Consider lighting. It has become more commonplace to use bright white LED light fixtures. One feels examined, everything is revealed, shadows retracted. What implications would this have on the soul? The anxiety of a hospital or the comfort of a sunset? Modern tastes require we make everything bright and glossy simply because our technology is capable. Constant reflections offering no depth but revealing other gaudy fixtures. A bathroom, brazen and tile porcelain, metallic fixtures and handles. Certainly modern, but comfortable? Ignoring aesthetic for the moment, it seems that modern wares offer little natural comfort, but instead ugly manifestations of man. A disconnect from nature. The psychological impact of aesthetic is dramatically underrated as a utility in our time. July 8th, 1853, Manifest Destiny has led Americans into Tokyo Bay Harbor. High off the steam from the Industrial Revolution, Americans felt empowered to open Japan to the world for the first time in 200 years. Japan in 1853 is in the Edo period, also considered the Tokugawa period as they are under the rule of the Tokugawa shogunate and regional daimo. This militaristic dictatorship run by hereditary samurai resembled European 14th century feudalism, both in society and development. Here's an image of Chicago in 1860. Contrast this to Japan in the 1860s, Chicago is a developed metropolis, whereas Japan remains a rural community of mostly farmers under shogun control. As it would turn out, the introduction of new technologies to Japan from the Americans, like guns, would prove fatal to the shogunate monarchy. Literally, all samurais were killed by their own countrymen in favor of the rightful emperor Meiji in what's known as the Meiji Restoration. This marks Japan's rise to imperialism, adopting Western technologies and principles in their establishment as a viable world power. As Tanizaki ponders in Praise of Shadows, what difference would Japanese or Eastern influence have had on modern technologies developed in the West? Would lights, communication, paper be better designed aesthetically and anthropically? The Japanese could only adopt products to match Western influence in a timely manner. Adopting rather than developing explains the neglect for traditional human-centric design from the Japanese, but why was this abandoned in the West? The Industrial Revolution began in 1760 and lasted until 1840. Evolving manufacturing processes in Europe and the United States allowed for the first time in history a majority percentage of populations to live in cities and pursue jobs in manufacturing away from farms. The U.S. having been born amidst this revolution and enjoyed the rapid progress of society. Cities hosted hundreds of thousands of individuals in brick apartment buildings working factory jobs, indulging in consumer goods. 
Goods at the time were needs-based rather than wants-based. In this period of efficient manufacturing, momentum of rapid progress in mass production aimed at consumer needs, there is a definitive bias to utility. Efficient manufacturing doesn't consider the impact on its operators. Rapid progress doesn't offer time for iterations or consideration, especially not when meta-technologies are constantly changing. When the majority of people live away from farms, densely packed, and need to affordably improve their poor conditions, function takes higher priority over form. This is a pretty obvious conclusion. Given circumstances, America was never renowned for its introspection and beauty in human-produced products and buildings. How it spread through the world, how it still affects our modern age, and how it has influenced human nature in preceding generations is utterly fascinating. This is when the world abandoned aesthetics, when it abandoned care for human implications and became solely concerned with efficiency, utility, and globalization. To further illustrate my point, I'll be using architecture as an example. Architecture is the most consequential form of design in our world. Buildings erected thousands of years ago still stand, and the buildings we erect today will likely hold form even longer. We live, work, eat, and socialize every day in buildings designed by architects. Architects of the past understood that they could render a building beautifully without sacrifice to serviceability. Picture a modern aqueduct. Nothing but an uninspired canal. You may find it silly to critique the appearance of an aqueduct as it functions properly and services much greater populations than in the past. Yet the Romans, with inferior capabilities and logistics, were able to construct aqueducts we travel to see. Our modern age has blinded us to the absurdity of seeking out historical infrastructure, not for historical value, but for its beauty. No one in Europe has traveled with the intention to marvel at an American aqueduct, but Americans will travel to Europe to do precisely that. And this is not to say that Europeans are any better. They have let the past dictate their image. Any modern structures could have been built anywhere. Modern architecture bears no indication of origin. Monolithic concrete complexes are just as ambiguous in Germany as they are in Canada. We must make the distinction between inspired progression and manipulative appropriation. When done with passion, modern architecture offers elegance and simplicity, akin to traditional Japanese aesthetic. However, the modernism which spreads globally has been perverted by capitalists which exploit the simplicity into a contrived avant-garde functionalism. Imagine a developer's delight when simple functionalism became mainstream. No need to invest in beauty or human experience, just leave it as a skeleton and claim it innovative. The masses are dealt trite infrastructure while beauty is reserved a luxury only for the rich. This idea applies to all product and consumer goods. We seem to have a systematic bias towards utility. We must critically understand the importance of aesthetic, the effect it has on our human psyche, our motivation for progress, and our interest in depth. Well, you got through it. This thing took me like six months to make. I've been making it since June, whenever I finished my last upload um, is when I wrote this one. And in between, I got a, a full-time job, I caught COVID, uh, I got a girlfriend, and things just, you know, <laughs> been taking up too much time. I don't think I'll get around to making anything on this channel again anytime soon. Obviously, it's been like a fuck it's been like a year since the last one and it, it feels like 2 months. It feels like a month. It's crazy. But yeah. Thanks for getting through it and uh I'll see you next time.